You know, it really has been a cornerstone in the African-American community, especially since the days of Jim Crow. It's a safe haven for many people, a place where no topic of discussion is off limits. Of course, we're talking about the barbershop, where you can say anything with no judgment. That certainly was the case here. It served as a backdrop for our discussion. We talked with several influential men in the Kansas City community, and we basically held a mirror up to everyone to talk about what our community looks like and what we can do to change it. One. All right, again, I mean, you know, nothing's off limits here at the barbershop. Uh, my name is Kevin Holmes. I'm a news anchor for Channel 41. I anchor our 630 newscast. I've been here just shy of two years, and I have already, uh, no joke, man, fallen in love with Kansas City. I love Kansas City. Everything from the barbecue to the atmosphere. People ask me what I, uh, what I, what I don't like about it. The only thing I'll tell you is that we're landlocked. You know, I moved here from Savannah, Georgia, so living by the ocean and then moving here. But aside from that, the, what's not to love about this city? It has a lot to offer. It also reminds me of uh, any urban area USA. I grew up on the south side of Chicago in the city. So um, several of the challenges and hardships that uh, Kansas City suffers, Chicago suffers as well. As a result, several of the uh, triumphs that uh, a great city like Chicago has, I also see that in Kansas City, and I also see the opportunity for, uh, for upward mobility in many, many ways. Growing up in the city, I was just telling my boss Friday, uh, I'm 37 years old, so I graduated from high school in 1999, just this calendar year, 19, 2018, just this calendar year, four of my high school classmates have died, three of which because of violence, four of them because of heart attack. Uh, so, I mean, <laughs> being health, heart healthy is, is, is a whole different story in and of itself. Um, I see so much promise for this city, and I think it starts with, with movers and shakers such as yourselves. I think uh, two reasons why I chose journalism. One is because, it's, you know, you write the first draft of history. Some of what we do is going to be in history books. I think that's pretty cool. But the other thing is um, what breaks my heart about what I do is sometimes when I see people who look like me, who have similar upbringings to me, and I'm reporting on them for bad things. So hopefully we can start the dialogue to try and, 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 and shift that, that pendulum, if you will. So I'm going to start with my left and then work your way around. To, just tell me what you like about Kansas City and what you want to see moving forward. Okay, well, I mean, I'm Joey. Um, I love everything. Just like, really, I just really love Kansas City. Uh, I always joke and say that the more that I travel, the more I actually fall in love with Kansas City. Uh, I love the opportunity. Um, I love the, the cost of living. <laughs> you know, uh, I definitely love the food. Uh, I love the atmosphere, the people. You know, I just, uh, I really love my town, so. So, I'm Jermaine Reed, uh, city council member here in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, you know, we're in 18th and Vine, uh, the heart of what I believe this city actually stands for. Uh, when you think about jazz, music, uh, you think about baseball, you think about barbecue, it all pretty much originated right here in Kansas City. Uh, and those are the things that I love about this city. Uh, you can go anywhere on any night uh, and find that happening or go travel anywhere across this entire world and someone's going to ask you about going to 18th Divine, they're going to ask you about um, uh, the barbecue, they're going to ask you about jazz or so. And so those are the things I love about it. But also I love the diversity of our community, um, this entire city as a whole, uh, with over 210 neighborhoods that this um, community actually consists of half a million people that live here in this city. Uh, it's one of the things that I, I like the most about it. Uh, and a host of other things, but I'll say that for the rest of our discussion. Well, before we move on, gentlemen, where can we improve most as a city in your eyes? I would stick at the whole piece of just diversity and how do we actually come together as a community and not just use it as part of a, um, a talking point, but something that we actually do embrace. Um, and regardless of what side of truce you live on, uh, I think that is one of the most important pieces that we really have to embrace as a, as a community. Uh, in addition to that, I think that providing job opportunities uh, to those in our community, some that are returning back, uh, perhaps from uh, being incarcerated, but how do they come back into uh, and re uh, associate themselves back into the community becomes extremely important. I think that's an important piece of it. Yeah, yeah, without a doubt. I mean, I would say uh, improvement is, I feel like that's a that's a never-ending process. You know, uh, it's always going to be something that can be better or something that can change. So in regards to what needs to be improved, uh, I don't know. I guess it would be more so what other things can be more appreciated, you know, because I think it's a lot of stuff that goes on within the community. It's a lot of people that's trying, it's a lot of uh, events and organizations and associations, a lot of people are trying. And I mean, as uh, far as me, I'm in a barbershop every day, so I'm hearing the conversations, I'm seeing the efforts of others. Uh, so 
uh, I think it's more so about what should be more appreciated versus improved. And uh, kind of like what Jermaine was saying about the, you know, uh, the transition from, you know, one place to back into society, so to speak. Uh, I believe, of course, that's that's always needed. You know, it's just, you know, bottom line, so that would just be resources. You know, what other type of resources are available and making sure that the resources that are available are there for everybody. So, but, yeah, that's my spiel. Uh, Milton Thomas, and I guess well, without really repeating what it is that, that these two gentlemen have said, what I like about Kansas City is the opportunity for innovation, if you see it. And, and so that will kind of roll over to me as a problem because a lot of people in certain areas, certain urban courts, they don't have access to the technology to kind of stay ahead of the curve on, on certain things. Uh, I mean, just something simple as digital currency. There's thousands of people that know nothing of that. That's a problem. That's an issue. So it's like it has to be a way to we can do more of an outreach and kind of bring people up to speed on certain things so they can kind of catch and seek opportunities, you know, to, for their children. So that's, but I like everything about it. I travel a lot, man, but I love everything about Kansas City. Uh, that's never changed. I try to talk myself out of living here several times, and it, it never happens. You know, I go somewhere, I'm back in a week. You know, it's just home. And um, it is a lot of stuff that people don't appreciate, but it's a big gap in between, you know what I'm saying, learning curves on certain peoples in certain areas. And that's where I think we should make changes at, or work towards it at least. Hey, uh, my name is Eric Dickinson uh, with the Urban Ranger Corps. Um, man, I just love Kansas City. I was born and raised here. Uh, this is home. Uh, I'm gonna get I'm gonna get a little crap for this. I was born on the other side of the river. Somebody throw something at me. I'm from Kansas, but uh, I uh, Kansas City metro area. I know it. I know it. We're in a barber shop. I spent much time in a barber shop. But uh, seriously, uh, Kansas City's home. Kansas City is one of those places that. Uh, I get tired of hearing there's nothing to do. There's plenty to do. Uh, there's plenty of nightlife if that's what you're looking for. There's plenty of good restaurants and good shopping. Uh, Kansas City is just a, a good, wholesome kind of place for me. Uh, if you ask about improvements, um, I think we got to find different ways to bring back the city. Uh, I think that we're losing uh, a lot of good uh, people and people currency, if you will, moving out to the outskirts of town or of the area. But we've got to figure out a way to move back into Kansas City. We've got to rebuild it from the inside out. I think this is what uh, our city is lacking, is getting uh, good quality folk to, to move back into the city. Uh, I've recently moved back to 53rd in Cleveland. I love living in the city. Uh, I'm close to everything. It's, it's, uh, it's been good for me. It's been good for my family. I really enjoy it. So I love Kansas City. My name's Adam Leatherwood. <clears throat> I'm a civil rights attorney. What I love about Kansas City is Kansas City is a big, small town. But what I don't like about Kansas City is we still struggle with tribalism. We have a problem looking beyond our own neighborhood. Our school district is a prime example of that, <clears throat> that we're only willing to commit time and money to the immediate communities in which we live, uh, when in fact, we're all part of one big group and I'd like to see some more efforts and that's part of the reason why I'm here tonight to learn how we can make an effort to break down some of those tribalistic barriers and come together as a community as a true community my name is Damon Daniel I'm with the ad hoc group against crime um, what I love about Kansas City, it's really already been said in, in many ways. This is my home, uh, born and raised here in Kansas City. Um, I would say that, uh, I mean, there's, people would expect me to say that what can be improved, of course, is our uh, fight against uh, or combating crime. But I'll, um, I think that Kansas City is still one of the most uh, segregated uh, cities that you'll see uh, uh, in the United States and it's not just segregated as it relates to race uh, it's segregated as it relates to economic status uh, and there are so many pockets uh, that have been created that has concentrated poverty uh, which has bred so much of what we see in terms of the symptoms of crime and whatnot and so those are the area that's an area that we really need to improve upon is how we are leveraging better economic opportunities um, investing in small businesses, 
uh, investing in our youth uh, as well to sort of close that economic gap um, that we are experiencing. Well, I'm Marcus Gibbons. Uh, what I love about Kansas City is uh, just the people. You know, I come get my hair cut by Joy every two weeks, and it's always something positive going on in this water shop. Always something, nothing negative. Uh, but the thing about Kansas City that that needs improved is our education system. Uh, the gentrification that's going on. It's a, it's a lot of things that's going on that's been getting swept up under the rug. And we have to educate our young people about what's going on because to stop the process in its tracks. You know, you got this place over here off of 27th and Tracy where they where the church is, where Beacon Hill and stuff like that. You know, that's the prices on them houses is too high. You know, we can't afford that three hundred thousand, five hundred thousand dollars houses, and this is right dead in the middle of the community. And I think we have to start by investing in the community to where we all can benefit from. It. Until we start, until we do that, nothing is going to change. It's still going to keep on going and going and going to where, you know, it's it's just it's not it's not going to benefit the people of color. Period. It's, it's just not. And I was born and raised here. I didn't had people die. I didn't seen people die. It's, it's, it's crazy. So, you know, that's the things that needs to change is educating our young kids about making change in the process. Hey, young sirs, I'll, at the end, um, <clears throat> the mice can't pick you all up. What I want you to do is listen and any questions you all have at the end, I'm going to mic you all up and I'm going to talk to you all one on one, the two, or two, or two young people. Okay, so I'm still introducing myself right now. Yeah, yeah, still introduce yourself. Okay. But, I'll, so, but I, I, I want to ask you all some questions at the end, and then if you have questions, <coughs> two of you, I want us to have a little dialogue as well. Okay, all right. Well, um, good evening. My name is Kenan Hill. I attend Ray South High School. Uh, I'm going to be a junior this year. I am 16. Uh, I'm also uh, a part of the Urban Ranger Corps with Eric. Um, one thing I will say about, uh, I like about Kansas City is also a lot of what y'all, uh, yeah, what you guys have, have said already. Um, I like the atmosphere. Um, the food here is great. I was raised here. Uh, the diversity is amazing as well. So uh, it, I don't think there's nothing that can go wrong with Kansas City. Really, there is a lot of places to go, just like Erica said. Um, one thing I do feel like we need to improve on, just piggybacking off of what you, uh, you two men have said here, I feel like we don't get together enough, have enough gatherings, and uh, get together to actually communicate with each other and, um, you know, make an impact on our youth. So, you know, I've heard it like a thousand times, you know, as I'm growing up, I've heard, you know, you are the future, you know, you have to make a change when you grow up. So, um, I want, I, I feel like we should be, uh, we should get it uh, together, not just with our African American culture as well, I feel like we should all be getting together and, um, Make an impact on our youth and make an impact on ourselves as well. So, well uh, I'm Darren Washington. I'm a student discipline officer for Kansas City Public Schools. Um, what I like about Kansas City, love, um, small town feel. Uh, I just came back from Dallas, Texas, so when you got to drive about an hour to get to everything, it's like, look, I can't do this. <laughs> I just want to eat. <laughs> so, but, and, so when you get back to Kansas City, it's like, I just go down the street. So yeah, it's time. You save a lot of time. Uh, I've been working with youth for over 20 years. Uh, you know, my biggest thing is youth. Love them to death. Uh, I work with the juvenile court kids, at-risk, high-at-risk kids. Uh, kids are kids to me. I don't care what color you are, whatever, if you need some help, I'm gonna try to help you. Um, I think education, we were just talking over in the corner, is when you talk about education, it's just not about school district. It's about everybody coming together to educate. I didn't learn everything in school. I learned a lot from my mom, my aunt, people that's embraced me. Uh, I've learned from Joey, I met him when he was this tall, couldn't talk. But, you know, look, he, <laughs> but the thing is, is that Joey explained to me what he was going to do, and he's done it, and he had the drive, and so it's just coming around and meeting his family and his brothers and, and seeing that, you know, when people come together in a positive light, you will see a lot of change happen, uh, and then it will expand and expand, but I think if we 
you know, one of our biggest issues is education and, and employment. And I think how that education is rolled out needs to look a little different than it has been in the past because traditional just does not work. And so uh, I don't know about anybody, I'm not traditional. I'm, I'm, I work out the box, never been in a box. Right, so the box. that's kind of how you have to work with kids nowadays. And so to change systems to do that takes a lot of time and effort. As you guys talk about what we can do to make this city even greater, I want you guys to keep in the back of your mind how those barriers right now may contribute to crime. And we'll talk about that a little later. But uh, yeah. Um, Buenas tardes. Uh, my name is Luis Cordova. Good afternoon and thank you, Joy, for making me feel at home. Uh, we were having a conversation earlier today and uh, I said, I heard you're the best barber in town. He goes, well, I, I, he, and then he asked me, are you married? I said, yes. He goes, oh, <laughs> I don't know what that meant. So <laughs> no, I'm no. not going to cut my hair with you Joy, man. You <laughs> give it to me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even going to edit that together. No. <laughs> <laughs> Joy, what did you mean? <laughs> Yeah. Not, if you get a haircut, the haircut might get you in trouble. Is what well, I, was well <laughs> I still don't know what that means, man. That means he's gonna have barber. I, mean, I got you, man. Look so okay. Good. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so, so, so it's gonna be fresh. Yeah, right. right. So oh. anyway, I work for the uh, Kansas City Public Schools, and I'm the uh, chief uh, division of student support officer. Uh, and in that role, uh, we 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 provide social emotional support to those kids that are experiencing emotional distress, kids that come to our schools that uh, have issues at home, domestic violence, substance abuse, uh, sexual, verbal, physical abuse. Uh, and, and to me, uh, I think that's the reason why I'm working for the Kansas City Public Schools, because number one, it's a challenge. And number two, I came here uh, in, in, to Kansas City from uh, Los Angeles, California. Uh, in 1988, and I've been in this community since 1988, working in different capacities. So to me, I love Kansas City. Um, I just got married in, in, in uh, Pasadena, California, May 30th, and my brother asked me, hey, why don't you come back and live here? And I said, I couldn't, because I consider Kansas City my home now. I'm a native of Kansas City. Uh, with that said, um, one of the issues that I would like to and continue to advocate for, <clears throat> uh, at least for the Kansas City Public Schools, is really stabilizing the leadership. Dr. Bedell came in. I've, I've been on the superintendent cabinet for the past eight years in, a, in an executive position. And in that time, I was able to, to see the trajectory of the leadership and the focus of the leadership four different times. And I asked myself, when are we going to stabilize this leadership? And when Dr. Vidal came in here, and I told him this, I said, I'm glad you came here because you're a breath of fresh air, in my opinion. And, and, I, and I validate that because I've been through four different superintendents. So to me, I think that the education system in Kansas City needs to be stabilized. And once we stabilize, then we have to have the community to back us. We can't do it alone. And Dr. Vidal has talked about this time and time again. We bring in all these charter schools to disrupt the public school system. We're not against charter schools. Dr. Vidal isn't against charter schools. What we are against is the playing on the same ball field, the same level ball field. Because if you have certain restrictions for some and certain restrictions for others, then you don't have a system that's stable and you don't have a system that's fair. And then we talk about equity. So to me, I love Kansas City now. I've been here since 1988. I consider this my home, and I will continue to do what I can to advocate for a good, solid public school system here in Kansas City. My name is Brian B. Shining, co-host of the Morning Ground with Shane and Shine on Hot 103 Jams. Uh, don't do that. No more interviews for you. <laughs> there was a fly, Brian. Come on, no, man. But, um, <laughs> yeah, this is my house. This is like. Kansas City's my home, born, raised, matured, got spanked here. Uh, everything that I accomplished has happened in this city. Um, and there's a lot of things to love about our city. The, the deep-rooted culture that we have here sitting in, in uh, this very spot, you know, on, on 18th Divine. There's so much culture here. The sports, the barbecue, all of that. But the thing that I love the most is the true entrepreneurial spirit that we have. There's a lot of small businesses, a lot of black businesses. We're in one right now, um, thanks to Joey. 
Um, and that's pretty much the thing that I love, I love the most is that if you're not a hustler, you're not going to survive here. And that's on white collar, blue collar, no collar, whatever. Um, the thing that I think that we need to improve on the most is, and a couple of you all have touched on it already, is our sense of community and support. Um, I'll go back to when I was in high school playing football, and we only had 50 people come to the game. <laughs> you know, there's no, I've never heard, I never heard of a booster club till I went to college. Yeah. You know, I think those, the, I'm not blaming all, it all on the parents, but, and I know, you know, parents have certain obligations and they have to work and they have to do this and they have to do that, but we have to make time out to support our children and what they do. So I think our sense of community and support could, could, could improve. And I'm not even sure if that's just exclusive to our city. Mm -hmm. This could be an issue around the United States. But that's just what I see and what I grew up on here. Last but not least. My name is Trey Myers. I'm going to Rockhurst next year. And then I came with Damon with At High Group and Crime. What I like about Kansas City, you know, it's a lot of room to grow. Like, if you want it, you just got to go get it. But, like, it's not a lot of people that's going to go get it. Like, how they want to get it. And if they do get it, then it's either the right way or the wrong way. And most of the time, it's the wrong way. So, what I love about Kansas City, you know, I'm from here. You know, I was born here. We, um... <laughs> It's a lot of stuff to do. I know y'all already said everything. <laughs> and then, yeah. Okay. Well, you know, when, when we started this, this, this project a few months ago, uh, me, Jermaine, and one of our producers went out to lunch, and we talked about uh, the group we want to form. And I think the one prerequisite we decided on was the love for Kansas City. Y'all all love Kansas City, right? Mm -hmm. I love Kansas City. So with that said, if you love Kansas City, I'm sure your heart aches sometimes when you watch the news and you see people as young as Trent, people our ages on television and not for the right things either. My question for you all to start up this open conversation, this dialogue is why are we seeing our men, our young men getting younger and younger, either being crime victims or crime suspects and how can we stop it? I'll start it off. I think that a lot of our young people only see one way out. And I'm talking specifically in our urban core. They see one way out, and that's the street. You know, I'm, I think they might see other ways. They might think of college. They might see college on TV. But I think some guys think it's unrealistic. So I think they, it's not necessarily the easy way out, but it's the only way that they see. And in, 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 in a lot of these kids' homes, they're growing up with no figures around, the mother's at work, they might not have a father, or the father's at work and they may not have a mother, or they're getting raised by their grandmothers. So they see this, the, the, the only figures that they have are street guys. And they see this way, and they're like, boom, I'm just going to follow this way out, and this is the only thing that I see, this is the only thing that I know. So I think that that's one of the issues. This is a very complex question because there's a, there could be so many answers to this. But that's just the, 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 the thing that I see the most is that these guys don't they don't they don't they don't see or or they could realize what their potential could be either by going to college or by going to trade school or just doing something other than the street life. So that means that, that kinda of goes with them not having the adequate or proper support at home. Because yeah, like yeah. people looking at street guys, that's been forever. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? But if you get your you get your base core from your home, from your mom or your grandma and the thing is I think what a lot of and I got six kids, so I understand about the kid thing. Most of these young young kids, like their parents are still young. Their parents are still trying to figure themselves out. Their parents ain't got themselves together. So that's how they get caught up in laws, because once you're 13, 14, you you dropping off the porch. Yeah, I, I think you're, you're absolutely correct because what we're seeing in the schools, and you can uh, follow up with that, Mr. Washington, but when kids come to school, they come with these issues already. And, and if you don't get to the core of these issues, then they're going to be continuing over and over and over again. And what we're talking about here is poverty because when you're looking at the social and economic class of the city, you ask yourself, can people live on the amount of money that they're that, that they're that they're um, um, that they're paying them? Number one, number two, how many of those parents have education? To me, education was my salvation. 
And I believe that education could be anybody's salvation because in education, then you could promote yourself to something more than, than, than what you're settling for. The other point too is in our public schools, how about if we had a two-year certification program for those kids that don't want to go to college? Because not everybody is college bound. So we have a two-year program in a public school that will focus on the labor. J, J, uh, what J.E. Dunn hires outside because he can't complete the labor force of Kansas City building homes, electrici electrician, uh, electricians are hired from outside. We have to build something so that when kids graduate, they're already moving into the workforce. That's job and career ready. So if we don't do that now, then we're going to have the same issue that you just talked about of kids just roaming around doing nothing. You all don't have vote take anymore? Yeah, we do, oh, but I'm talking about a two-year okay. a two-year program. When you leave, you're certified to do heating and air. Mm -hmm. You're certified to be a master electrician. You're certified to do plumbing. You're certified to build. You're certified to do all these things. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we have a vote tech, but it has to be specific so when kids yeah. get out into the workforce, they get a job right away. So do we live in an area that only perpetuates the stereotype that there are two options, college or the streets? Don't, don't forget entertainment and sports. You, you, you know, you got the five-foot kid who says he's going to the league and he's going to be the next LeBron James. I mean, I think there's some unrealistic goals and ideology that young people have from watching TV. I'm either going to be, I'm going to be an entertainer, I'm going to be an athlete, uh, I'm going to do all these kind of things, and it goes back into hustling, is also going to be on that list of things. I think the things we need to look at is how do we put more... Uh, successful men in front of our, our young men. You know, how do, how do they get a chance to watch you on TV and figure out I can, be, I can be Kevin Holmes? Or what made Kevin Holmes become Kevin Holmes? You know, there's somebody somewhere that sparked somewhere a long time, well maybe not that long ago, but a, a few years ago that got sparked your interest to be, I want to be a journalist. And everybody in this room has been sparked to go a different direction. Whatever our directions are, we've all been sparked to do something differently by somebody. But how do we keep making that spark alive in the city? How do we all give back? And I think we all got to find ways to give that spark back to the young people coming behind us. Uh, I also feel like it's our education as, uh, as well. For example, I grew up right off of uh, 72nd and Paseo. I went to University Academy, which is right off Truce, and it's primarily black there. Uh, so the majority of the, um, the teachers and advisors there are primarily black. Um, but while I went down there, I went there to, through, second, uh, through second and third grade, I was very successful. Um, their test scores are better than Raytown uh, test scores, which is the score that I go to now, which is insane because um, University Academy is primarily black, and you go to uh, Raytown, you have all of this diversity, but you have a bunch of kids that just feel like they, they you know, they don't want to do anything with their lives, or they have other goals, just like uh, Eric, has, Eric has said. But I switched from University Academy to, uh, to Raytown, and there's more Caucasian teachers there that just don't care about what. They'll, they'll even tell you to your face, hey, I don't care. I don't care what you're doing. I don't care if you're not succeeding in my class. Whereas if you went to University Academy, they'll, they're pushing you. And they're on your back the entire time throughout that. I feel like if you build up a strong, you know, a strong, you know, child, it's easier than, you know, trying to repair a broken man. Just like Frederick never said, you know? Uh, and to piggyback on him, the big thing about University Academy is, they have a big parent involvement piece. Yeah. Yeah. And so when you talk about school, and that's, we talk about the education, you have to have the parent backing because they are, like you said, at the home front. <clears throat> so when you're saying, hey, your child's not keeping up academically, we're going to do these things at school to help that student out, then the parent is the one making sure that student is pushed to stay at school, do those type of things. Uh, like I said, the ma majority of the kids that flow through me are the ones that you're talking about. The high at risk kid, they've already been to juvenile detention, they've been in and out, they're already experiencing all of that type of stuff. So when they come across someone that has to have real talk with them, a lot of times we get some uh, high professional educated people in front of them but they won't talk and won't really break it down to the youth that this is why this is not going to work. I don't have a problem talking to the five five foot saying, no, you won't be dunking on LeBron <laughs> in the pros because you're just tall. <laughs> and then break it down of why you need to go another direction and then get, help them come up with other options uh, that they're good at their skill level. This is what I see in you and build them up. And we don't have that going uh, consistently in our school district or in, in our school systems. I say our systems because we're all connected. What I've noticed uh, in the, probably the last five years 
we have a lot of mo high mobility. So kids might end up at U UA for a year, get put out, go over to this charter school, get put out, and then move over here and then end up back at KCPS. So when you're doing all that shifting and moving, that's a lot of education you're missing. Is there a direct correlation between that and crime? I mean, last year <laughs> we had like 170 some odd homicides. And this year for at least the first third of the year, we're on a path to break that. You know, things have kind of tapered off a little bit, thank God, but it's about to be summer. It's already summer. Y'all know folk don't know how to act in the summer. Is there a correlation? And if so, what can we do about it? I think what it boils down to, man, is really exposure. You know, I don't want to oversimplify it, uh, but really, as I'm, even as I'm listening to everybody, whether it's being exposed to opportunities, whether it's, you know, better educational opportunities, being exposed to quality teachers, or being exposed to violence in the home, where you then learn that behavior uh, as well. So I, for me, it, it just boils down to what our young people are, are exposed to, uh, whether good or bad. Um, we we want to say that everybody has a choice, which you do, but if you are exposed to individuals or a mother who is addicted to drugs, your choices are limited in terms of where you're gonna go uh, until you get that positive reinforcement, that positive exposure. So for me, I think it just boils down to what, what we are exposing our young people to. Yeah, it's like, 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 it was, if it's like trauma in the home, like if a kid's mother die, and then he go looking for that love somewhere else, like in the streets, that's not right. So you're gonna need somebody else to come and like take them over. Cause like nobody can, I don't know how to say it, like nobody can take your mother's place. But like they gonna need somebody to step in for that, and then it could be the wrong people, or they can go to the wrong place, and then it's just all bad from there. You know, I'm glad you said that, young man. What what we've been talking about, what I've been talking about for the last eight years, is the trauma uh, issue. So so we have kids that are traumatized and are coming to our schools, right? Yeah. So research says that how can a ch child learn when that brain has been traumatized? There's no way you're going to be able to reach your math scores. There's no way you're going to be able to sit in class without thinking about what's happened last night or, or what you saw in the streets. There's no way you're going to learn. So learning is tied into that trauma. And if we don't deal with that in the school level with the family and the students, then it's going to perpetuate. It's going to continue going on and on and on. So, trauma-informed care is 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 something that all schools need to be uh, um, aware of. And number and number two, creating trauma-sensitive schools is a big, big uh, district-wide initiative that we began two years ago in the Kansas City Public Schools because we saw that the child needs that social-emotional support to deal with the distress coming into a school setting. And then you're expected that the teachers know that. Well, they don't teach that in college. Unless you're in a psychology class or you're a mental health class, you're not going to get that. So, you know, what I think I hear you saying as well is that just holistic approach, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, for me, it becomes very personal. Uh, I grew up in a single parent household, mother, four, uh, I have four brothers, five boys. I'm the best looking one of, of, <laughs> of five. But, um, you know, the, the average household income in this city for a single family is probably about $47,000. And you put that on top of what I just mentioned of a mother trying to make sure the lights are on, make sure the gas are on, make sure there's food, you know, on the table every day for my brothers and I. I mean, it's, it's a challenge. And so that whole wraparound service uh, piece is extremely important because you become kind of a social service uh, before you can even get to the education piece. Because a, a lot of times, a lot of kids who are in the uh, school system, this is the only meal they're going to get all day. <clears throat> um, so most of them are only coming for, you know, perhaps something to eat in the morning and something uh, to eat at lunch. And then per perhaps, you know, that snack that they're able to take home uh, in the evening and that they sometimes use for the weekend. And so how do we have that uh, whole piece that's fulfilled that comes to a direct correlation to what are the other things that they're going to do outside of school uh, when they're not there learning? 
uh, for me, I didn't feel, Brian and I went to uh, Northeast High School together, um, and I didn't feel the school system prepared me uh, for the rigors of the, the full world that I was getting ready to um, experience. And if it were not for the cl cliche that we continue to hear is about it takes a village to raise a community and what is that exposure, if it weren't for those um, you know, pillars of our community and people who embrace me, I probably wouldn't be where I'm at today. Um, and I think that that is one of the most important pieces because what happens, we see the, the high numbers of crime uh, that we continue to, to, to see. You know, folks trying to figure out and not knowing the ways to actually uh, handle a situation or a conflict uh, and they think you got to res resort to some type of gun, uh, some sort of violence, some sort of physical altercation or something and these are the things that happen and they don't realize well wait a minute there are ways that we could maybe talk through this situation we can handle it different differently we don't have to go out and retaliate uh, against each other and I think that we have to be able to address that, but then going back to the larger point of what you said as well is about preparing everyone for the workforce so that you are able to get out there. I mean, we're getting ready to build a brand new airport here in Kansas City, a billion dollar project. We have a disparity study that hasn't even uh, been passed uh, by the full city council. Uh, we have um, a development community and, 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 and folks who continue to say, well, we don't have enough folks to, that are that prepared to work. You know, what are we gonna do? We've got to make sure that everybody's prepared. You shouldn't have to change your zip code to be successful in this city. And I think that's one of, we, one of the things that we continue to see. And if you look at the statistics, it does show you that there um, is a, a repeat of the crime, the violence, all of that based off of just zip code alone. And we've got to be able to figure out how do we address it. And I hope that in some point of this conversation, we can, as a group, even collectively talk about that as well. I like that, I like that idea because Another piece of that, that social and that emotional thing that kids deal with. Y'all younger, so y'all can tell me if it's different. But let's just say if everything's not right at home and then when you go to school, yeah. and if you ain't got on the latest shoes, you ain't got on the right clothes, you're hearing a whole bunch of crap from the people around you, so you're not even thinking about learning. And that's what's pushing these young kids out, out the door like that. I went to Northeast, but I went in the early 90s when Northeast was a whole different story. You know what I'm saying? Mr. Brown was still there. He was still there, but it was, <laughs> you know, it was every gang in Kansas City. Yeah, well. they were. So yeah. you didn't know if you was coming home. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? If you wasn't doing certain things or knew certain people. So, but I know that pressure, you know, bullying. And then y'all got all this technology yeah. to make it even Just worse. Get ready to say that. <laughs> Social media is a whole different yeah, it thing. It makes it even worse, man, than that least. But here's the deal, and I agree with everything you all said, but when it's all said and done, you appear before that judge, you can't say, well, man, they was roasting me in school. You can't say, well, I didn't have this or that and other at the crib. How do we get around that barrier as leaders in this community, though? Can I, can I just chime in real quick? I, I, because Dr. Godoba was just saying something that, that sparked uh, uh, something in me. So y'all know how the church used to really be the, the, the center for, for the underserved parts of our community. Today, we are leaning on schools to fill that role. There are schools that have washer and dryers in them because our kids are coming to school with the same clothes. That goes to your point. We got schools that got daycares in them now. So the question I, I keep wrestling with is, is it okay that we put that level of pressure on our school system to fill that role, to be all of those things? When you talk about a trauma-sensitive school, that means that this school understands that this black boy that's coming into this classroom got here by dodging bullets or may have just saw the neighbor's house get shot up the sitting in his classroom hungry didn't eat got the same jeans on he had on the day before yesterday and we expect the teacher to recognize all of that and teach this kid this math equation is it fair that our school system has to do that? But that's just where it is today. Our schools have to really kind of feel that same role as just like the church. We, the church was a safe haven for people. We learned that we got our education there because we, it was segregated. We couldn't go to other schools, right? We got our health care there. We, we ate there. Now the pressure's on the school system to do that too. That's just where 
our society, this is where everything has driven it to. But, but you know, it's okay, it's okay to put pressure on the schools because it's the right thing to do. However, saying that, I think that the community needs to step up and say, how can we help? How can we provide these types of resources? And I'm not just talking about social emotional support, but any and all resources that contribute to a well-being environment, if you will. Uh, and, and, and it's okay for me to feel that pressure because like Mr. Washington was saying, I love kids. I, I would do that for my kids. I would do that for your kids. Because if I, I was one of those kids back in the days growing up in LA in a gang infested territory, we didn't have that stuff back in the 60s. We didn't. And, you know, I, I had to, they segregated me going to a theater. We had to go to the balcony because that's where all the people of color were. And that was in L.A., man, 1960. So, so the civil rights, you know, I, I'm glad we have a civil rights lawyer here because he sees the cases, he sees the injustices, he sees what needs to be done in our community. But it, it, it can't just be one entity. It has to be all of us. Like you said, man, we're a community, and we should step up wherever we're, we're needed. And, 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 I would, and I don't want, I'll say this real quick and give it to you, so 30 seconds. You know, the church has evolved so much that everyone isn't even going to the, to the church for a safe haven. And so I think that's mm -hmm. the most important piece is we, we grew up watching the Cosbys, A Different World. We saw uh, some real positive images of black culture on TV. And today, you know, you could talk about the 1968 uh, uh, race riots or uh, what I happened watched. with Martin Luther King. I yeah. mean, you were there, yeah. I wasn't. But today, you know, we have a whole new shift in our sort of thinking with Black Lives Matter and how do we mm -hmm. sort of embrace these things. And so that's why I, I submit to the uh, point of, you know, how do we actually have a wraparound where all of us are taking initiative uh, to, to own up to how do we help each other. So. Please. Uh, I think personally, I think the education uh, system is is wrong. It's, it's, instead of teaching our kids how to be leaders, they're teaching them how to be followers. You know, and that goes back far, far, so far back. But the thing is, is that they're not challenging our kids. <laughs> they're really not. Our kids are so smart, like super smart. <clears throat> The IQ test, that was invented by uh, a German way back, a long time ago. And it was designed to, 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 to dumb down the education of, you know, people of color. You know what I mean? So the thing is, is that, you know, my wife is a, a, a teacher. And she goes home, she's a mother and a, a, a teacher 24-7. So as soon as she leaves school, she comes home and teach our daughter. So it just don't start, start, stop at school. It got to come home and be taught. And, you know, my daughter, she doesn't really care about what type of shoes she got on or nothing like that. I think that also has to deal with with how we teach and teach our kids, you know, materialistic things is is not where it's at. You know what I mean? And you get it like how he said, uh, some a gentleman said that uh, that uh, that our kids are, you know, coming back from a certain. They're they just it's crazy, man. It's just they're. They're lost. I've always, th I'm sorry, brother. I'm saying I've always thought about it as a as an issue, especially uh, in classrooms of uh, oftentimes compliance versus curiosity. Uh, oftentimes we're all about everyone being compliant. This is the syllabus. This is the regiment uh, versus kind of tapping into a child's curiosity. Let me ask you all this, uh, kind of shifting the conversation, but still keeping it the same. What role does race play in all of this? I don't think race is as big as the issue now, well, coming from the Kansas City, Missouri School District, as it is about class or economic opportunity. Um, I think the more money that you have available to you, the more opportunities you're going to have, point blank period. Because, you know, with me and Jermaine going to Northeast, there were Hispanics, there were whites, there were blacks, there were mixed kids, there were whatever race that you can think of, they went to Northeast High School. Um, and, and everybody was treated the same. 
Uh, but the, the thing that we all had in common was we didn't have money to go to Rockhurst or we didn't have money to move to uh, you know, Blue Springs or something that, that, that had a better infrastructure um, within their school system. So, I mean, race plays a part. I'm never going to downplay that, especially in the, in the climate that we're in now. But as far as, I think, class or, or economic uh, availability is, carries just as much of a burden as race does. It's like, like, like money, like money and race is like not this, I don't know how to say it. it's like not, it's, it's not mixed together. It's like if, if you white and then you fresh and then you black and then you fresh, y'all the same people. Mm -hmm. But like if y'all, if you like white and then go to a black school and then you fresh and then they're gonna try to rob you or something. I like that's, I don't really know how to say it. You doing you good? Right you doing good? Yeah, yeah right. that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Keep it raw. Yeah. Well, but in this climate, we, we, I mean, not, you did not say it wasn't important. So let me get that out before you throw something at me. But we got we to be honest and say there's still things that go on that this gentleman behind me can speak to that we're still getting uh, pulled over at, a, at an alarming rate. Uh, black men are still thought to be dangerous. You still have, the, have people who, who come in contact with us who still don't really know how to take us. You know, I, I spend my time in boardrooms in different places that I still get funny looks of, well, how'd you get here? Well, hell, I got here the same way you got here. But, you know, you still have that, that uh, fence around some of these places in Kansas City that I, I don't care how much money you have, your, your skin tone is still not going to get you by, behind the fence or behind the door. Uh, the golden rope, the red rope, whatever you want to call it in some places in this city, as, as friendly as it is, it's still very segregated and it's still very much... Um, it can be a tough place in Kansas City that you're still trying to figure out how to navigate it. I'm almost 50, well, I'm almost say almost 50. I am 50 years old. And you look at some of these things and have they really changed in my lifetime? I don't think so. Not, not as much as you would think they have as progressive as we say Kansas City is. I think, I think the political climate uh, speaks for itself. Uh, I know that when uh, President Trump was running for president, uh, he made some very uh, racist uh, remarks. As a result of the political rhetoric, people think that words can't hurt. Sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. I mean, that, that's totally, you know, uh, you know wrong. Yeah. So I, I want us to really think about the political climate in Kansas City. Now, I've been here since 88, and I've, saw, I, I've seen the racial divide, you know, the line on truce, both sides. I've seen that. I've been experienced to racial slurs myself, uh, and, and I've also seen students in our public school system experience ignorance in terms of things teachers would say to a student who may be undocumented, who may have a DACA status under Obama's uh, executive order. So, so these things are, are part of ignorance. I may not put it into the racist category. But it could be. So, so I don't know the person, and I would assume to be on the safe side, say they're ignorant about certain things. But when you look at Ferguson and when you look at the, uh, what is that, travel advisory, I I'm saying, man, they only do this in Mexico and Colombia with the drug cartels and in and, and, and other parts of the country. That's where you get your advisory from traveling. And I never knew that Missouri put one out, the NAACP. By show of hands, how many people in this room have either been profiled and or been a victim of crime, whether it's Kansas City or anywhere else? Just by show of hands. You know, I mean, it was our fault and I did not. How do we change that narrative so that the next generation, if they have this barbershop series on 41 Action News after my days are retired, folks, Trent's age, don't have the same hands raised. How do we change that? We got the wrong people in the room. We got to include. Right. We got to include other people in this room right now because we we're all the victims. Well, not I mean we're we're most of the victims. You know we need the people who are doing these things to come in here so we can talk to them. You talk about words, and the words do hurt these days because of the fact of social media and things can be printed and things can be implemented into people's heads. These false narratives about black men. We're all black men in here. Well, most of us are black and Hispanic man, men in here now. We're you know having intelligent dialogue. I'm pretty sure there's people on the other side of the. Truth 
juice line that we've been talking about who thought that we could never do something like this. So we got to include those people in this conversation because we're all, I think, we're all of the same thinking. Uh, and, and, and we've all been victimized by it. I got pulled over in high school because the officer, I was riding down by East High School on uh, Van Brunt. He thought I was selling crack. Like he straight up said, uh, where's the crack at? So he eventually searched my car and didn't find anything. And his whole demeanor changed. Okay, don't don't come around here anymore because you know there's a drug war going over here or whatever. So um, he, we got to include those other people in this conversation. I can say uh, I'm kind of going back to what really kind of in between this these three gentlemen right here was talking about. But one one thing that really stuck out to me was what Marcus said about process. You know, uh, and then kind of going to what you were saying about. Um, you mentioned how does that work when a young person go to court and they say to their judge, they say to their lawyer, hey, Facebook bullied me or it made me do this thing. I believe that there will be a, a point in a time one day where that, that judge or that lawyer, because of the processes that they went through when they were young and coming up with whatever, that they will understand what Facebook is and how Facebook does to people. Uh, they will understand uh, the stuff that we're talking about because, again, if we're going back to what, what he was saying, exposure and process, you know, uh, uh, legacy, you know, legacy involves a great deal of process. And, and me, like legacy is one of my favorite words. You know, I just, I'm a firm believer in legacy. And when I think about legacy, I think of about investment. I think about paying it forward. And I also think about just like 20 year and 50 year goals and, and genders and things that we can hit. And, um, and just kind of saying like, like, what is it? I, I don't think that the answer that you're looking for or that we even might be trying to search for is right now. I think that really it takes individuals and really like-minded people to understand that whatever it is that we really want is not going to happen today, but what are we truly willing to die for and truly willing to work for and live for? And I think that goes right back to what he was saying about process and changing the minds. You know, uh, it shouldn't be the school's job to teach you know, uh, legacy per se. That should be something that should be in the house. That should be something that your your mother and your father should be proud to pass on a tradition. You know, uh, something as simple as cooking, and I'm not going to get too far off subject, but something as simple as cooking, something as simple as sewing, something as simple as, uh, um, you know, just, just, just showing love and empathy. You know, uh, uh, you know, we grew up, that's one of my, that's one of my oldest brother there. My middle brother's not there. But uh, we grew up in the time, and I'm going to kind of touch on a little bit about you saying about the emotion, because that's a huge part. We grew up, in, we, we grew up on 42nd Bell Fountain, you know, back in the 80s. Um, three young males raised up by a single mother. You know, uh, back then, if you came in the house for any given reason, uh, crying or, or whining, you was either one of three things. You was either a punk, a sissy, or a fag. You couldn't show emotion. You couldn't show, you know, if you came in the house with your leg broke almost, you know, so you really couldn't show emotion. Uh, if you just got jumped by five or ten guys, you couldn't show emotion. Uh, the number one rule was you better get back out there. Like I, I, so many times I heard you better get back out there. You better fight. You better finish. You better do this. And if you don't, I'm going to whoop you. You know, and I think that that was a process. And the processes that we're at now is, we grew up in this whole generation where, you know, we had a lot of emotional scars and mental disabilities. You know, so when I was younger, the, the word mental disability was re really kind of paraphrased as being retarded. And I'm not trying to sound politically incorrect, but retarded was the word. And when you thought about retarded, when I thought about retarded, I thought about handyman on In Living Color. You know what I'm saying? A guy that ran around with a cape on, slapping his chest, trying to bite his ear. Like, that's what retarded was. Not understanding 20 years later that retarded was so much deeper than this dude jumping out the window thinking he can fly. You know what I'm saying? Retarded was like, I'm mentally tore down. I got, yeah, I got some mental things that I'm going through. I am traumatized. I am emotionally scarred. I'm going through all this stuff, but I don't have no outlets for it. I can't talk to my cousins, I can't talk to my brothers, I can't talk to my sisters, because if I cry about it, if I show any kind of love or any kind of, any kind of emotion, I'm a punk, a sissy, or a fag. I don't want to be none of that. And I think that's where we're at now. And when we say stuff like, so what, how's that young kid going to say it to the judge or the lawyer? I think at some point they will go through their process where they will understand what these generations are going through. And, uh, but I guess my whole point to it all is that process, legacy, investment, paying it forward, that kind of stuff is so important. And what we're doing right now, whether we want to notice it or not or pay attention to it or not, 
we are now, you know, investing into a legacy of changing minds. You know what I'm saying? We are now investing into like these young men right here, they're going to go back at some point and have a different kind of mindset and the ideology of when, if he ever in your shoes, like you said, he's going to have a whole different thought process of how this kind of stuff should work. You know, um, so I, I, again, like at the beginning, we were talking about, you know, what can be, I guess, value more versus what's appreciated. You know what I mean, like me, I this kind of stuff I really appreciate. You know what I'm saying? Me being able to pick up a phone call and have brothers come out and actually care, like, I, I think that shows what it is, but I don't think we're going to get that answer we're looking for. I think it's more so a commitment of how many men in this room are really committed to living their life and really ready to die for the fact that you really want some change. You know what I'm saying? Like, well, how many of us are really ready to stand on regardless of what it takes or how hard it's going to be, even if you don't see the change happen in your lifespan, how many people are really to, ready to stand on that and stand for something? And just my opinion that should be the question asked everybody you know what I'm saying what i'm living the way that i want people to talk about at my funeral that's simple you know what i'm saying like how many other people are doing that and that's thanks to my mother that's thanks to my village that's thanks to my family that's thanks to the people that's around me that's thanks to the people that's pushed me and more importantly that's thanks to god you know um and i just that's that's my spiel, ain't it? Like saying, get to me. No. You know, I made mean, my haircut with you. <laughs> I think the most important thing is 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 trying to figure out how do we how do we become role models? We're, we're, well, let me back up. We're all role models, good or bad. Let's be honest. I mean, I think everybody in this room is a good role model, but we also got to realize that what we're doing right now, we won't really know if it worked for 20 years. I joke all the time that the the work I've done for years with youth development. Hell, I won't know if it worked until these kids are my age. Right. You got to go back and see, well, these young men, what would they do in the community? Will they make it different? Will they be different men than the men that are in the communities today? We've all got to keep doing what we're doing. But really, um, Joey's right. The legacy is what we're going to leave. And we got to figure out who's going to pick up the, the mantle and carry the flag or whatever expression you want to use. Who's going to follow us? Who's going to be the young men who are going to make their neighborhoods different? Who's going to be the young men that are really showing uh, progress in the process that we keep talking about? It's all about what's coming after us. We've all got to keep, keep doing it, keep getting the spark, but it's really trying to figure out how do we keep this kind of dialogue going? How do we keep doing this? Some of these men in this room, most of us, I've seen somewhere. You know, that's the funny thing about it. The same people are doing the same things different places. Most people in this room I've run into somewhere. Some of you haven't. we got to continue this dialogue, continue to work together. Well, let's end it right there, but stay where you are because I want, I want a final thought from each and every one of you. We'll start from here and work my way around. What I want from you guys is, uh, from people in, in our community, and people who will be watching when the story airs. What is the one takeaway you want from them and how can we push the narrative moving forward? We'll start so, with you. Like, just care, you know? Like, you have to care. Like, if somebody don't care about you, care about the next person so they can care about the next person after them. It's scary, yeah. Uh, I think uh, he touched on it earlier is um, having a better foundation at home. Uh, whether that's your parents, it's your big cousins, whether it's, and this is not the kids' responsibility. This is, uh, this is actually all of, all of our responsibility. You just got through talking about us being, being role models. I think we all play a significant part in some kids' life, whether it's your nephew, your little cousin, your son, whoever. Um, uh, there has to be a better foundation at home. So there's not that much pressure on the schools as we put on them. Um, and um, yeah, that's it. Just having, having a better foundation at home. I appreciate that, brother. Uh, for me, it's really uh, uh, the point that we've all made to, today is that we need to uh, get involved in some aspect of Kansas City public uh, community. Uh, so to me, involvement is the key. And instead of pointing the finger, uh, we need to point it at ourselves and say, what are we doing to make this a safer community to live in? <coughs> I would say uh, if you're going to be involved, be truly involved. Get in the trenches. You can sit behind a desk. You can email. You can do all that. But when it, when that kid's standing right next to you saying, hey, I need some help, really step your game up and help them. And do what you can do. And if you can't do, like I always say, if I don't have the answers, I'm going to go find them for you. But, I mean, do something. Don't just say, 
well, that's not my call, my role, or whatever, because it is a village. And if, if it's, it's not just us, it's a village. And if you're not willing to work with each other to make it happen, then it, it's not going to happen. Uh, I think where we are, a lot of us get uh, misled, is that we don't hold ourselves accountable. Accountability plays a big part with me. Uh, just because of everything I've been through. So I think we got to start holding ourselves accountable and teaching our young people how to be accountable and accept things not always for what they are, but accept it and keep pushing forward. Don't never give up. You got to keep going and going and going no matter how hard it is because you will never see the light at the end of the time. I think um, what I might be taking away from this conversation um, or what I would encourage the viewers who see this um, is this is really, you know, for me, I'm going back to that word exposure. Um, so I would say, how are we conscious about what we are exposing ourselves to? And how are we conscious about what we are exposing those who are coming behind us too as well. And the more uh, conscious we are about what we are exposing uh, our young people to and what we are our, our, ourselves are limiting our exposure to or how willing we are to venture out, uh, the more we learn about each other, uh, the more we can learn about, uh, the more we can even pass on knowledge uh, to others as well. And so I would say that exposure uh, is extremely important. And this is a great model for getting to a place of understanding, uh, particularly differences when you talk about coming to the table and having a, a, a real, real dialogue, real conversation with one another. David, do me a solid. Take your mic off and give it to the brother behind you. And slide, slide the mic up the shirt for me, because he, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. from the bottom up. Thanks, Rex. Okay. That's it. You're up, brother. Oh, you want me to stand? No? All right, cool. I mean, okay. Um, one thing that I would encourage is for people to actually realize um, and stand and be able to make a commitment to um, actually be involved and make a change and be ready to be ridiculed and criticized for, you know, um, whatever perspective that they stand on um, and be also be ready to, you know, actually die and have, some, have, you know, have something to, you know, go off of or, you know, just like you said, people be at your, uh, be at your funeral and actually have something positive to, uh, to say or whatever. I feel like, uh, I feel like people just need to be able to make, uh, make a change for our youth and make a change for all of us sitting in this room and everybody uh, all around us. So. Both my young people are 16, right? 15. 15 and 16. 16. <clears throat> Boy, you about to grow even more. All right. Yeah, <laughs> <I was thinking. laughs> man. Jeez. Oh, that mercy. Okay. Three, four days, right? Man. All right. All right. All right. Adam? Well, I have uh, two things. Uh, on the one hand, there seems to be a sense of hope in this room, which in light of the fact that we live in perilous times, and so much is at stake. I think that part of the moral imperative that we have is to get involved politically. We stand to lose. I think all of us are, share a number of things in common. Our commonalities exceed our differences. But if we do not act, we will wind up in a very, very desperate place that echoes and harkens a time of a hundred years ago. A lot of the things that we've talked about in terms of economic opportunity, in terms of political opportunity and being heard and the impact I think that those have on families. You have families that have to work two jobs just to make ends meet. We can provide 
a moral voice, we can provide an active voice, but that's only going to be of limited effect. The implications, I think, are much, much broader than that and much, much more important. So on the one hand, I have some hope. On the other hand, it's profoundly saddening to see that in 2018, we're still discussing discrimination. I have not suffered from the same kinds of discrimination and violence that many of you have been exposed to. And that kind of makes me feel like I'm a little bit on the out. But the fact that we're even still discussing it is really sad. I, I don't see color in this room. I don't see ethnicity. When I walk down the street, I don't see any of those things. And the fact that we have all of these voices that are coming out, especially political voices, that try to encourage me to see those things and to make distinctions based on those things. It makes me angry and it also makes me sad. But I want to thank all of you for affording me the opportunity to come and be here with all of you and to listen. I've learned a lot and I appreciate that. Thank you. You know, I think the biggest thing that we have to, the biggest takeaway is that Kansas City, someone said earlier, is a big small town or however you worded it, I, that's, that's spot on. The other thing I think we got to realize is this isn't a this side of truth problem versus that side of truth problem. It's a community problem. And if we don't all figure out how to fix it, we're all going to be in the same hole together. And I think that's the biggest problem that this community seems to have is that we're still dealing with these situations as if, if it doesn't affect me directly, it's not my problem. Well, it does affect you one way or the other because the crime and different things, it creeps. And people, when, when, the, when it gets to Roland Park, now it's a problem. When it gets to Lee Summit, oh, now we got a problem. Well, it's the same problem that, that we're living with in the city. So we got to remember this is a community problem. It's a community issue. And we got to all keep working together to, to figure out how do we solve our own problem. It's a family problem. It's all of our problem. Um, my answer is always going to be a hot. I would say uh, what I took from this, and if I wanted somebody to pay attention to it, is uh, tap more into to humanity, uh, kindness, uh, stop stereotyping our young males. It's just like, you know, you keep poking the bear, he's gonna respond, he's gonna act. Sometimes you can just take the time out of a 30 second, two minute conversation with a kid, and you could put something in his head that he ain't never thought about because he ain't never heard it. You know what I'm saying? And that could change his walk. You know what I'm saying? Because everybody is motivated by something different. Something different pushes them. Whether it's to do something good or bad, even the bad stuff, something motivating you to do it. And I think more people that have made it out or even made a little something of themselves, just take their time and just talk to a stranger. Not nothing with a camera in your face or, you know, nothing that needs attention. Like, you can feel a person's spirit when they're walking down the street. You can feel that. You know what I'm saying? You have that ability if you begin to tune in with it and just people just need to reach out and just say hi. Sometimes a simple hello could change something he, and I'm not saying you do, you just standing right there, but something that he might be <laughs> contemplating on doing. You know what I'm saying? Just shaking your hand can change that. I think people need to do that because they there's a lot of cast aside that, that goes into people upbringings too. You know what I'm saying? Let me change that. So um, before I get to the heart of the question, I want to say thank you publicly to Joey as well uh, for hosting us. I should have probably said that in the beginning. You know, I come here every week uh, to get my hair cut, and uh, some some weeks I get a nick, other weeks I don't. Um, <laughs> it's a shop. I mean, I'm just saying. I come here, I pay my cash, do what I do. Uh, but you know, I think. Um, in all seriousness, it serves as an important backdrop to tonight's discussion because the reality of it is is that every time I come into the shop, and I don't matter what shop, it doesn't matter what shop I believe that you're in, these type of conversations are happening. Um, sometimes, you know, they have, I think, a, a real impact on the decisions that a lot of people make. I mean, Joey, you see mothers sometimes who are in here. Uh, you know, this is probably the only time that they're interacting with, you know, uh, African-American males or just men that could say, hey, young man, sit down. Don't do that. I mean, and, and I see that. So I want to say thank you. I think to the heart of the question of what you're 
basket in terms of a major takeaway of tonight's discussion. Uh, that is, is I think that our rhetoric must match our commitment. No matter what part of this community that you live in, um, I think all of us are committed to wanting a better life. We all want that hope. We all want that sense of pride for the city that we live in. And we all oftentimes talk about it. But I believe that we are at commitment time where uh, we must be committed to making sure that every young person um, has an opportunity. We must be committed to make sure that young people aren't dying in our streets. Uh, and we've got to make sure that our rhetoric matches that commitment. Um, and I think that in this important backdrop of this barbershop conversation, I think we have to, almost like the church, take it beyond these four walls and in every part of this uh, community so that everyone has an important place of making sure that we're committed and saying that we're, we're ready with our hand up and our boots and whatever to make sure that we can make a difference. Uh, I mean, honestly, I think everybody didn't really say it. Like, I, I kept trying to think, what am I going to say to wrap things up? Uh, and with every time somebody talked, I'm like, damn, there goes that idea. So, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, I guess it just goes right back down to what I said earlier. My favorite word is legacy. Um, invest. Believe in yourself. Believe in your dreams. Believe in your visions. Put some action to it, you know. Uh, just really put some action to it. I, I'm a barber, so I live by the motto, and I say, y'all probably hear me say it a million times, after every head I cut, I'm unemployed. You know what I mean? I'm never full. I'm never satisfied. I'm always looking for the next. Regardless if somebody think I'm the best or the worst, I'm just a barber, and I'm just going to keep on marching forward. You know what I mean? So um, I would just say just just, just that. Just, just keep going. God don't make no mistakes. You know what I mean? So whatever you're doing in your life, whether it's right or wrong, good or bad, it's for a purpose. You know what I mean? It, it, it might be for somebody else to learn from. I don't know, but um, just, 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 just live for tomorrow. Live for tomorrow. So. <laughs> oh, okay. Interesting question. My takeaway is this: uh, oftentimes we hear the mantra, "It takes a village," which is true to a degree, man. It also takes parents. It also takes mentors. Uh, mentors are very important. Uh, 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 you know, and I, I know there's way more organizations than just this, but every every city I go to. I try to be a big. Uh, I got a little who's about to be a sophomore central right now. Um, because I think the village alone raises an idiot, the village idiot. Without the mentors, without the parents, without uh, uh, other influential people. Because it's one thing to see Granny Mae from the side of the block saying, don't do that. But it's another one to see somebody who looked like you, somebody who you admire, somebody who you, who you want to aspire to be like. To me, that is the big takeaway, that we all need to be that person, be the person that you want somebody to follow in your footsteps. And I think uh, it's important that we increase that narrative because as a journalist, um, I get tired, man, sometimes. I get tired. I mean, I get tired of seeing people who, who look like me, people who have had similar upbringings as me, who are on the news not for a good thing. Chicago has, uh, where I grew up, we all know how violent it can be. There's also a, a, a good component. There's a, a school, which wasn't around when I was in high school there, uh, but it's a school that has routinely for the last five or six years graduated 100%, it's all male school, it's graduated 100% of its student body every year and they go to college. Yeah. Shit, why can't we, shoot, why can't we have more, why can't we have more of that on the news? You say why, that why can't there be more of the narrative yeah. versus seeing somebody that age behind bars, someone that age accused of robbery, somebody that age accused of theft? And I feel as if a, a lot of that, changing that narrative starts with the groundwork and the groundwork starts with people like the men in this room right now. So that's my takeaway. I hope you found the conversation insightful, but better yet, I hope after listening and hearing about some of the problems that plague our community, you take some of that and put it into action as the men you just heard from vowed to do the same. Chime in on KSHP.com, let me know what you think, or send me a message on Facebook, KSHP Kevin Holmes. Thank you for listening, and let's keep the conversation going and put it into positive action here in Kansas City. I'm 41 Action News anchor Kevin Holmes.